everybody to this week's edition of The Soapbox. My name is Hugh Bouchelle, and I'm here with Cher McCoy. Say hi, Cher. Hi, everyone. And our very special guest today is Dr. John Raynon. Uh, you may best know him, uh, especially in this area in, in Western Virginia, as the president of uh, Dabney S. Lancaster Community College. However, what you may not know is that in his more than 30 years of higher education, he's been a teacher, an administrator, and a college chief executive. But I, something that really surprised me when I, when I read his bio was that he was uh, a first-generation college student and the first member of his family to earn an advanced degree. I think that gives him kind of a unique perspective on some of the things that we're going to talk about, especially today. So uh, along with his list of accomplishments, almost too numerous to name, so I won't even try, uh, he also recently made news again when he was selected as a member of the Board of Directors of the American Association of Community Colleges, headquarters in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Dr. Renon. Well, uh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's good to, it's good to have you here. Uh, so tell us, uh, just to get things warmed up, uh, what have you been doing during the shutdown? Were you, were you in your house or what would you do? Well, uh, yeah, the shutdown has been the most interesting piece of my 30 years, I'm sure, <laughs> as, it, as it is for, you know, for most people. Um, I actually found uh, the first week I struggled a little bit because I had never really worked from home and I missed the interaction on campus. But I finally was able to get my groove, I think, and um, I, I have found that the um, – that – our team has been wonderful um, and we have really come together. We helped our students get through the spring semester, you know, right at midpoint and, and being able to do that. And, um, and we're, we're up 26% in enrollment for summer. Wow. And we're up about 3% right now for fall. So, so things are looking very promising. Um, and, you know, I, I guess the biggest thing for me was uh, I wasn't necessarily an exercise person before, you know, before that, because I was always running every which way and everything else. But I think it was that second week that I forced myself to get out and start walking. And I've been walking five miles a day for, you know, for, for about 15 weeks now, almost Ooh. 15 weeks. And um, I feel better. I just sort of, uh, I do most of my walking at night, so it's sort of the winding down type of thing. And I'm either looking, uh, um, I'm listening to music, or I'm listening to books on tape, you know, or something. And uh, it's just a good way. Uh, it's typically just an hour because I I do a lot of my walking even during the day while I'm on the phone. I end up pacing in my house and being able to do that. Um, and I have found that's important to sort of break up because I'm, I'm in zoom land as we call it, you know, as we all call it for hours and hours a day. So instead of sitting in the seat for hours and hours, uh, when I have the opportunity to be on the phone, uh, I'll put, I'll put my headphones in and just be able to sort of walk around the living room and, and the kitchen and, you know, and everything else. And it just keeps me, keeps me moving. It, it, you know, keeps me moving, but um, I've seen, I've seen a lot of, uh, I do a lot of trail hiking and running and uh, getting out and I have seen a huge increase in the number of people using our outdoor activities. And I think that is fantastic. I really do. Right. And we've also, you know, my wife and I have also done yard projects that we've been talking about for a number of years, but I feel like so at the end of the day, I stop, I change, and then we can work. Um, you know, my, my whole, I guess my whole uh, body and practice has been very different. And for me, it's been a positive thing because um, I guess early on, I heard the joke, what does COVID-19 stand for? And, and everyone said it was the 19 pounds everyone's going to, uh, um, um, uh, you know, increase. Uh, that we were going to uh, gain during during the time, and I couldn't afford to lose uh, to gain 19 pounds, so I've gone the other way. So, yeah. so it's been uh, it's been good. But thanks for asking. Yeah. Good for you. Well, I have a question for you. Um, what exactly um, does AACC do? 
Sure, good question. So the American Association of Community Colleges uh, represents uh, pretty much all of the 11, just under 1,100 community colleges in the country and in Canada. Um, and it's a membership organization and they have a number of areas that they, um, the biggest areas at is uh, certainly advocacy in, in DC. So they are, they are, um, they are in many cases, the legislative liaison for a lot of co colleges on a, on a more of a global type of approach to community colleges. Um, and so they do a lot of advocacy. They do a lot of, um, they're working with um, federal agencies to potentially make sure that community colleges are part of uh, a number of the um, grant opportunities, federal grant opportunities and so forth. They're, um, they're also very big in workforce development. Um, we were fortunate that um, I also, as part of my board membership, I've been on, they also have a number of what they call commissions. These are committees. Um, I, I, I just finished my second year on the small and rural community college commission. Uh, and, and those individuals are, are all presidents from smaller colleges and they are trying to sort of define what a rural college is. Because if you look at things like, uh, what does rural college or rural education, it's five agencies and you have five different definitions of what really rural is. Um, there's a marketing and public relations commission to be able, there's an academic and student support commission, those types of things. So I've been involved as a non-board member for, for a couple of years on, on those types of things. But the workforce piece has been very interesting because they have been able to advocate and uh, with the current administration where apprenticeships Apprenticeships has has risen to a priority, um, uh, really um, across the country, and they have been able to advocate to get something like twenty million dollars. And what they did was they the the uh, the the administration gave ACC twenty million. They turned around and and did a request for proposal from co from colleges to actually access some of that money to expand apprenticeships in your individual community. And we were fortunate that we were only one of 80 of the community colleges across the country to actually get one. It's not a lot of money uh, per college, but what, it did, but what it does is it's all the support on a national level that we can get, as well as funding for uh, to send somebody to their workforce conference and um, and uh, ultimately we we will serve over over a three year period uh, about 150 additional uh, uh, individuals in our community and they would be considered apprentices uh, being able to work with that um, so I, I'm, I know I'm shortchanging all of the things, but those, it's the advocacy piece and it's really the workforce piece that we have taken advantage of, uh, you know, great deal. I have just one uh, follow up. Um, could you in, uh, uh, go into a little more detail about uh, how they're involved uh, globally? Sure. Um, they have worked with some private foundations that do some global work and they've done, um, like for example, one of their affiliate organizations, I, I know I'm throwing a lot of technical, is the Community College of International Development. So there are a number of community colleges that actually partner, um, partner with international um, uh, colleges and universities because in different countries uh, community colleges are more at the high school level and and the universities is really more at the four-year you know level similar to what it is here but um they so they will work with a group such as the community college of international of international development 
where they'll create partnerships and for institutions that can accept international students, they have played some of that, um, uh, you know, they've broken down some of the barriers already for the, for the, uh, you know, for those institutions that want to get into the international recruitment components. Um, and some of the colleges that have athletic programs, for example, have recruited um, uh, student athletes from uh, certain countries to come and play soccer or basketball or whatever it might be. And uh, many international students want to come to the U.S. to earn uh, a U.S. degree as well. Very good. Thank you. I, I was wondering now, is this going to uh, affect your role as the president of at Dabney? No, not at all. Um, part of my role is um, you know, they say college president is basically the living logo mm -hmm. of, of a college. And I currently serve as part of my responsibilities. I serve on about 12 active boards. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I have served as president of the Lexington Rockbridge chamber of commerce. And, mm -hmm. uh, I serve on the economic development, uh, you know, organization in Allegheny County. I serve right now on the Botetot Chamber because that's another one of our areas. And so, uh, no, um, basically for me, it, it will just mean one more additional meeting a year because I'm already attending two of the, two of the, uh, of the meetings that happen uh, that I'm already going, one because I'm on that commission I mentioned so I would just have to stay an extra day for the board meeting. So it really doesn't change anything. Um, it just, you know, I've always looked for things that would benefit the college bottom line. And from some of my relationships, from some of these organizations and these national meetings I go to, it's brought some dollars to the college, but it's also brought some new opportunities to the college yeah. as well. Uh, I was thinking that was probably the case that if nothing else, it'd be a huge advantage for the college to have you <clears throat> sitting there on the board of where these things are happening. So, yeah. And you know, the relationships, you know, I mentioned the apprenticeship piece, um, the relationship with another organization. Uh, we have really been involved with the, uh, with entrepreneurship over the last three years. Um, and, and we're a partner with, a, uh, you know, with another organization. But in, for that national organization, I was able to meet a funder and the funder, uh, and because of that, and this has been, uh, you know, if you've been in the fundraising game, fundraising takes, it, it, it's, it's more of a, uh, a um, you know, it, it's much more of a series of dates versus, uh, you know, versus, uh, you know, jumping immediately into a marriage, yeah. you know, type of thing. So um, that just recently, um, I, I just found out three weeks ago that brought us a grant for $400,000 with that relationship. Okay. And um, um, so, you know, it's these relationships that, that are at both not only locally, but also on a national level that has brought things to the college that if I wasn't at the table, probably, probably, and most likely would not have happened. That's good. So what, um, what do you expect to see this fall in higher education? Sure. That is the, that is certainly the $64,000 question these days. Um, I can tell you that we have already announced and we announced that the early June, that we will be predominantly online. Um, we will be, so if it's a lecture class, we will be predominantly online. If it's a career in tech program, such as nursing, uh, welding, forestry, those types of programs, we will, uh, we have worked out a plan to serve those students in a safe environment, um, uh, meeting all of the requirements and so forth. Uh, they will do their lecture portion via Zoom, and then they will do their lab portion, probably broken up. And, and um, uh, uh, the perfect example is 
our science classes are typically 24 students and what the faculty member has decided that she will divide that 24 into four groups of six. We have six stations in, in the classroom and the class meets normally Tuesday and Thursday. So group A will come on Tuesday, group B will come on Thursday, group, a will come, group C will come the following Tuesday, and group D will come the following Thursday. And so uh, you will do some virtual labs, but then you will actually do the hands-on lab every two weeks to be able to do that. Um, we, we are probably going to be using, we may be using our gym for a uh, classroom because it's, it's a larger space being able to wheel in, uh, um, you know, training units and, and whatever that might end up being. Um, ultimately the goal is that we're going to serve, uh, all the students that we need. But in reality, we're not going to have many students physically on campus for the fall. I think that a bigger picture with higher ed, um, well, let me back up and just say that the most of the community colleges in Virginia are going to have a very similar model that, uh, that we are. Um, I think that a number of the four-year institutions, um, I think that they are, even though they may have announced that they're going back in person in the fall. I think that um, I think the reality, and and we've seen just from the last couple weeks of the increase in the spikes across the country and in many states, not fortunately here, but certainly in many states. Um, I think that they may find themselves also doing in a hybrid model or certainly starting online. Um, I, I do know that most of the four years are saying that they're going to go back either early, a week early, and they're going to end by Thanksgiving um, to try to get them much more concentrated because as the weather gets cold, uh, we, uh, the pandemic could certainly uh, increase. So if, if students then, it, uh, and that certainly makes sense, then if students go home for Thanksgiving, then they don't have to come back because if students go back home, then they may have to get retested and be able to come back. Um, but uh, it is still, uh, my line is that we are building this plane while we're flying it. So uh, what I tell you today will, will most likely change on Monday. So, um, uh, I mean, we had things early on change three times in a day from the, from the state from the community colleges and everything else. So I've learned to sort of, when I get a piece of news is not share it for at least 24 hours now because it may change. Well, I, I, uh, this next question is a speculation on my part and I want you to tell me where I'm wrong. Uh, because as I've looked at this and I, I've seen it from both a four year and a community college perspective and it seems to me that if you had to deal with a virus like we're dealing with right now, community college were better prepared. Uh, we were already online with a lot of stuff. We had a, we had a lot of things that, that fit right into this. And so here's my speculation. Uh, you tell me where I'm wrong. I'm speculating that this terrible situation, <clears throat> excuse me, may actually work out better for community colleges than it will for the four year, just because the community colleges were more prepared to, to handle it. Plus, I think students, if they're not going to be sitting in a classroom, they'd rather be going with a community college. I, am I wrong? Well, I think that that, um, so typically a community college and us at Dabney, for, mm -hmm. for example, but I know that in my two previous community colleges that I worked, um, community college students will typically wait to the last minute to register. What we typically do is any, we, we gain about 25% of our enrollment after August 1st. Hmm. And we start typically around August 20th, okay? We expect that we will, that number will be increased even 40%. And partly because when, when uh, first of all, parents, 
will will really start second guessing. Am I going to send my son or daughter to a dorm? Okay, mm -hmm. um, when they could take, um, when they could go to Dabney and take fifteen credits in the in the fall semester and cost a fraction of the dollars versus sending somebody to a four year tuition plus room and board when it's going to be difficult. We will also get, um, most likely, we will get students who will decide that, well, if my university is going to be online, why should I pay that much more higher tuition when I can take my general education courses through at, at your local community college and be able to do that either for a semester or for the whole year. And typically, you know, our tuition for about 30 credits is about $5,000 mm -hmm. versus 20, 25,000, in some cases, 40,000 for the year. Um, so I don't think that you're completely, I think you are correct. Um, different areas, it's going to be very different. And, and, and uh, what we have talked about at Dabney is, um, is that um, we are, for example, we need to keep, if every college could keep 10% more of the students that they have, we'd all be up for fall. So what we did was beginning week two, when we went out of the pandemic, is we have coaches and advisors calling physically calling our students every two weeks mm -hmm. to check in with them. And then what we're doing is, we, so our, our, our business process has changed because you would think that we were normally doing that, but during a regular time, we're seeing students. So we're, we're checking in with them and, and on various types of things, but now they're actually getting a phone call or they're getting a text. Okay. Every two weeks just to check in. And a lot of times it's questions, it's more questions that are non-academic, okay? It's, you know, my, my, my parents just lost their job. I don't know if I can continue, okay? Um, we have emergency uh, funding dollars to be able to help those students like that. So we have a lot of the services. Now, uh, now if a student wants a four year experience and in a, in a dorm and everything else, you know, we don't offer residence on campus, but for potentially for a student to come to us for one year and earn 30 credits at $5,000, they, that still leaves them three years to, to get the college experience. Right. Um, and they've just saved their parents at least 15 to $30,000. Right. In uh, in either loans or actually um, savings. Well, in addition to what you just said, um, what, what do you see as a, as the future of of Dabney in this region? Sure, uh, that's a great question. So we are, um, matter of fact, we are um, our biggest project that we are that I have been working on since last August. And we are starting to come to probably some announcements in the um, in the very near future. In the next couple, is that um, we will be looking to add a workforce and entrepreneurial center in the Rockbridge region. Um, we have our Rockbridge Regional Center, which uh, has been. I mean, we've had we've had a presence in the Rockbridge area for over twenty years. We've been in our current Rockbridge Regional Center for about 10 years, and we offer um, uh, we offer a practical nursing program there, a culinary arts. We offer a lot of our gen ed programs. Um, we offer massage therapy there and everything. What we don't have space for is uh, the hard trades like welding, machining, um, diesel mechanic, uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Those are all programs we offer on our main campus in Clifton Forge. So um, I've been working with donors and, and um, the city of Buena Vista and, and Rockbridge County 
And we are getting close to potentially acquiring a building that w what we will do is spend the next six to 12 months renovating. And, um, and what we will do is we will be able to offer that as a workforce center. And because of the need and the, and the increased interest in entrepreneurship is potentially creating a maker space. And um, uh, so if you are, a, if you are a new business owner or somebody who's thinking about running a business, you'll be able to have a place for that, um, you know, in the Rockbridge area. So that's certainly, um, you know, one of the biggest um, projects that we're looking to actually work on. Um, and again, I've been working on it and I'm hoping that by September, we can actually make official announcement of some of the things that we're gonna actually be doing. So that's, that's certainly one of the biggest pieces. Um, the um so the next piece is also the um you know we're at that point in the year so uh this coming year we're supposed to be working on our next our next five-year strategic plan uh which has obviously been very bump uh, bumpy and and because things change so rapidly i think what we're going to do is do a three-year plan um and then be able to look at some larger things in that four to five, and then every year we can we can potentially update those. So those are really more uh, things in the in in certainly the near future. So have you actually found a location yet? A building? That we you're have looking at. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. we have. Yeah, we've identified that. We have pretty much all the donors line up uh, to do that, um, and we are potentially leveraging that potential uh, with some additional federal funding to actually help with the renovations and and so forth so um, yeah 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 it's really going to be a great great announcement great project so looking forward to that really looking forward to that uh, okay uh, I you know of course this is the soapbox and you're all you are officially on it and so what we like to do with all of our guests as we reach the end of our show is give you two minutes to leave the word with whoever you want to leave it to. You may want to say it to students. You may want to say it to parents, yeah. whoever. But it's your two minutes, and it starts, how about now? Okay. Well, I guess the only thing I would like to say is, um, you know, my 30 years in higher ed have been primarily in community colleges. And, yes, I am a first-generation college student, so I relate to our students. The majority of our students are first-generation Um that they are uh, lower income. They are, um, um, you know, most of their family members do not know what the FAFSA is, which is the federal financial aid form and so forth. Um, and I think that, uh, I guess from a soapbox perspective, I would say that community colleges uh, still are at times the second class citizens in the higher ed world, I think it is much better in the last 10 years. However, there is the, um, there is the perception, there's still a perception with parents, with students, with even K through 12, that the community college is only for the students that want to be a welder or just want to be a mechanic. And that's, yes, that is certainly true. But we have had uh, many students who have been valedictorians of their high school class who have been very smart, who have come with us to, for two years, saved their families a ton of money, and then been able to transfer. Uh, and in many cases, there are additional scholarships because you transfer from a community college to a four-year. And... Uh, you know, nationally, I'm involved. Um, I'm, I, I have a significant presence on Twitter and everything, and I'm involved with a couple of presidents around this. It's hashtag NCC for Community College Stigma. And I guess from a, from a soapbox piece is that, um, you know, we, we, we play a major role in serving the community but we're also going to be the major answer for the economy when we come out of this um, pandemic. 
Absolutely. around workforce. Employers are going to be looking for us. Um, students are going to be looking for us for this short term. Um, you, you know, in 15 weeks, you can become an EMT. And in 15 weeks, you can become a CNA, a certified nursing assistant. And you, and there are jobs, there will be jobs waiting for you. Um, and you don't need a full degree. You earn a workforce credential, an industry recognized credential. And then you remember us, you go to work, and then you come back to us at night and earn your associate's degree. And we have articulation agreements that then you can go on to your four year and then you can go on. We have even articulation agreements after that to, for a master's and even a PhD. So I would say from a, uh, an advocacy piece is that the community college plays a major role. Uh, we play, Dabney has played a major role for 58 years in this region. And, um, uh, and I look to uh, playing even more of a significant role at, for the next 58 years. Well, Dr. Renone, I appreciate that. Uh, that's pretty much it for our episode today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our visit here with, with Dr. Renone as much as we did. And uh, uh, we hope that we'll have you back again. And we hope It'll that be the, my pleasure. Yeah, the audience comes back again and checks, with, checks back next week when we'll have another episode for you. Meanwhile, everybody out there, stay safe, stay happy, and stay the course. Say bye, Cher. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Say, say bye, Dr. Renon. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for joining us.